2000 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals. We have uh, two board members absent this evening, um, Stephen LaPlante and Robert Cronin. Uh, first item on the agenda is the minutes of the October 24, 2000 meeting. Are there any comments from board members on the minutes from the October 24, 2000 meeting? No comments? I have just a couple. Um, at the top of page two, I would like to have the minutes um, explain a little bit, in a little bit more detail procedurally how we came to uh, reconsider the uh, page's application. And what I would like to add after line four is the following. Mr. Backer made a motion to reconsider the board's final vote denying the page's application. Mr. LaPlante seconded the motion. The motion passed on a vote of five in favor, zero opposed, uh, one abstention. And I think it's important that we simply have the minutes reflect the fact that there was a motion to reconsider that was seconded and voted upon and approved before we go on to uh, the rest of the minutes. And then on line 18, it says Mr. Keneally made a motion to reconsider. Um, actually, farther up, Mr. Uh, Keneally had made a motion. On line 18, I'd like it to read, Mr. Keneally renewed his motion for approval of the application. And then the only other change is on page three, line 27. I don't know how important this is, but the minutes now reflect that we discussed the format of the minutes, and it says it was decided to try to have concise and abbreviated minutes if possible. And actually, I think that what you'll recall, I had suggested that we consider whether it would be appropriate to have more concise and abbreviated minutes, and after discussing that, the board, by consensus, came to the conclusion that we should leave the minutes as is and not try to abbreviate them any more than they currently are. So um, I would propose that uh, to have these read accurately, that perhaps that be changed to say that the board discussed uh, whether it might be appropriate to have uh, more concise and abbreviated minutes. But after discussion, uh, the board uh, by consensus, uh, decided to leave the minutes in their current format. Would that be an accurate mm -hmm. summary of where that discussion led? <coughs> so with those proposed changes, uh, can we have a motion? Will we approve the minutes as amended in the October meeting? Second, uh, second uh, Ms. Miller. All those in favor? Opposed? None. One abstention. Mr. Fristasi. Uh, second item on the agenda is old business, and the only item listed under old business um, are proposed changes to the Zoning Board of Appeals rules and regulations. At our last meeting, we discussed proposed rules, and the uh, town attorney, Michael Hill, was here, and we discussed those proposed changes with him and asked him to put the proposed changes in final format, which he did and the board packet should include a letter from Mr. Hill with the revised rules and regulations. And the changes from last month are all 
in section five, which is on page four of the rules, section five, paragraph, <clears throat> section B, paragraph two, which now reads, the applicant shall submit 10 copies of the application and any supporting written materials to the CEO at least 14 days before the board meeting. In the event that an application is not submitted at least 14 days, before the meeting, that matter shall not be placed on the agenda until the following month's meeting. In the event that any supporting materials or other evidence is not submitted at least 14 days prior to the hearing, the application will be tabled until the next regularly scheduled meeting, and the vote to table shall occur at the commencement of the applicant's presentation unless the board votes to accept the late submissions and proceed with the hearing. And that change was put in there to encourage applicants to provide us with all of their materials, to submit all of, the, all of their materials to the CEO at least 14 days prior to the hearing. So the CEO, when the packets are distributed uh, to us, will be complete. And if someone submits new material at the hearing, the presumption is that the hearing will be continued. We'll have to do it at the inception of the hearing unless we vote to go forward and hear it anyway in light of the new material. So the thought at that time was if somebody submits a small amount of information to us at the time of the hearing, uh, we will more than likely proceed to go forward. But if somebody submits us with um, a large amount of material that we think we need additional time to consider, review, read, consider at the time of uh, maybe material that we would have wanted to have had with us at the time we did our site, drive by or visit, um, then we'd have the option to table the matter until the next uh, scheduled meeting. So any comments on the way Mr. Hill has worded the proposed changes to the rules? I think there's a follow-up to our conversation last month. I think that the language is concise enough that it, it does have the mandatory requirement that the the literature be submitted for the record for us. However, it does reserve our own discretion in that we can decide based on the information at the time to accept it and rather than table it. Um, and that also gives, um, gives us a chance to assess the needs and the circumstances for that particular hearing. Which is exactly what we were trying to exactly. have him incorporate. So I think it's well worded. Can we have a motion as to the amendment, the proposed amendment to the board's rules and regulations? I will make the motion. I make the motion to accept section 5B2 as drafted by Attorney Hill, um, setting forth the requirements of an application for applicants. Well, would you consider making the motion to approve the rules as a whole. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, because actually, I think there may have been a couple other minor changes, uh, very minor in the sense that the rules now refer to the CEO, where oh, that's in right. I forgot the we prior did. format, Bruce, what was the CEO building, called? Building inspector. The building inspector. Okay. So that's another change. Building inspector has now been changed to the code enforcement officer. Right. And we went over those rules last hearing. So right. I guess we'll back up. I thought we did that last hearing, but you're right. Um, I'll make the motion then. I strike the last motion. The new motion is to adopt the rules and regulations as proposed um, and drafted by Attorney Hill. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, discussion on the motion. All those in favor? Um, opposed? Uh, the motion passes on a vote of five in favor, zero opposed. And the new rules and regulations um, are adopted in the form as attached to um, Michael Hill's cover letter dated November 2, 2000. <coughs> When do these rules go into effect? 
When do the new rules go into effect, Mr. Code Enforcement Officer? Tonight. Tonight? I don't think there's any waiting period for it. I think it's the, the script. Based on, based on that, then, if I may, Mr. Chairman, if I may. You may. Um, reviewing the next um, mm. applicant, um, reading the packet that I received, uh, and I'm assuming they're all the same. There were several items that I found um, incomplete, and I was wondering if uh, any other board members felt the same way. Uh, more specifically, on uh, item number two, uh, 10 copies of all plans. An application must be submitted with this application, including site plan drawn to indicate scale, um, <coughs> scale showing location, floor B, floor plan, C, sewage disposal system, D, driveway and parking area. Um, I'll skip to the ones that Well, I if, if you can hold that thought and let's just move on to that item of business, let's call that up on the agenda. Well, I was going to um, <coughs> request that we don't bring it up and just leave it on the table. But you do it. You're running the show. Well, let, let's call yeah. it up on the agenda and okay. we'll decide whether to deal with it um, or not. Um, there being no other items of old business, um, the first item of new business is to hear the request of Michael and Lee Wilson, 82 Two Lights Road, tax map U39, lot 4, for a conditional use permit for an accessory dwelling unit. Um, are Michael and Lee Wilson here? Um, now, Mr. Frustasi, you can have a seat. I was, I was concerned about uh, items not included in the packet. Um, more specifically, the floor plan with um, dimensions on it, uh, sewerage disposal system plan, uh, the driveway and the parking area, uh, identifying where the uh, parking um, area will be designated for the uh, accessory unit, um, abutting uh, lot lines and street lines, uh, the actual setback dimensions clearly indicated. I didn't see this. Uh, setback measurements from the neighbor's house, garage, or shed, or other structures on the property, uh, and a building permit application. If I may address a couple of those items. Uh, the septic system design, uh, there is a new system going in, and, and I should have included that. There, there is a system that will, will handle the total number of bedrooms, including the accessory dwelling unit. I can assure you of that. Um, as far as the site plan, because of this existing situation, I guess it's probably my fault that I didn't uh, ask the applicant to submit um, dimensions to property lines since everything had already existed and there was no additional uh, additions going on to the building. I, I, I guess I took the liberty of not thinking that was a necessary part of this particular application because there was no additions going on. Uh, as far as a building permit application, there's, there's no application for a building permit because there's nothing being changed. It was an accessory dwelling unit that's been in existence when they bought the house. What triggered the, the applicants to come before the board was the fact that they needed to replace the septic system. And um, they submitted a um, septic system based on uh, a dwelling unit and an accessory dwelling unit. At that time, I looked at the records and found that there had never been a proper approval for this, and that's why the applicants are before the board. So, so the, there, there's no building permit application. The septic system design is on file, and it does meet the standards, I can tell you that. Right, through site the, plan. Um, okay, but through the chair, isn't he adding a bathroom or a kitchen? No. Isn't, it's already there? Everything's already there. It's in place, but he never received a permit, or someone they, never received the a permit? The applicants bought the house with the dwelling unit in there, uh, not knowing that it wasn't legal. So this is an illegal? Is that the case? That is the case. And this is an illegal dwelling unit? Well, we have nothing on the record to show that it got proper approvals. I'm not going to say it's illegal, because I don't know the history. I just know that nothing in the, in the file show that, that it was ever had the proper approvals. Well, you might want to um, would you come up to the microphone oh. here? Have we, have we opened this? I mean, we have a... Well, I'm not sure we have yet. Um, 
We're talking we, we, about the about whether we're going to discuss this at this particular that's right. time. That's right. That's right. We are we are not hearing the evidence on the right. application at this point. Right. Would you uh, tell us your name, please, and your address? I'm Lee Wilson. My husband, Mike, 82 Two Lights Road. Um, my comment was going to be that there was a, as far as I understood, an appropriate building permit for the unit but not for it to be an accessory dwelling unit. Is that right? There was a building permit that was issued right. in but that way, <laughs> way back, but there's no indication that it was approved right. for its use. Well, I'd, I'd like to get back to the point of whether we're going to receive this uh, request this evening or not, whether we're going to de deem this complete and whether we're going to hear it first before we get into uh, what's there, what's not there, and whether it's legal or illegal. <clears throat> Let me ask Bruce to clarify, yeah. because now I'm learning something that I didn't glean from the packet that we had, and maybe I missed the obvious. So the Wilsons are not proposing to build anything. That's correct. We're being asked to grant um, a conditional use permit for a condition that has existed for a number of years. That's correct. I, I didn't understand that from the materials we were given. Is, well, there anything, see, is there anything in the packet that we were sent that would have told us that? Well, no, the applications are set up as, as if it's a permit that needs to be issued on the fact that nothing was there. I mean, occasionally we have an unusual situation where, where, where something like this would happen and there's no real line for that. Um. Excuse me again. There is a letter um, that I believe we Point of order. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Frustasi. We're drifting away from my point. And, I, I, and, I I'm saying, and I'm saying that this application is not complete. There's a lot lacking in it. And therefore, I would like not to hear it this evening because there are a number of items that are important that are missing. You just made you just uh, adopted new rules. We've been leaning towards this. We've been drifting toward it for a period of time. All right. You cannot change the rules unless you go through the procedure that we did. We spent a lot of time trying to change them. All right. There's too much in this application that's lacking for me to pass judgment on this. And therefore, I'd like to send it back to get the information that's necessary. And that's the floor plan with dimensions on the floor plan, not a hand sketch of what we're, what we're looking at. I'd like to see where the parking spot is for the vehicle, setbacks and the property setbacks, what's necessary. I mean, it's, it's identified in the ordinance. And I'd like to see that we follow that ordinance and, and, co and collect the information so we can make judgment. The other thing that, that I haven't or I'm not satisfied with is who's going to occupy this dwelling unit. Uh, the ordinance clearly states that it's a member of the family no. or, or a close <coughs> association of the family. So I'd like to see or hear something, I'd like to see something in writing as to who's going to occupy it and well, fill in the blanks. The now, that's, my, that's my concerns. And I'll, leave, I'll let the rest of the board make their comments on it. I will, I will receive your comments as a motion to table under Section 5B2 of the board's rules. Um, until the next regularly scheduled meeting uh, in order to permit the applicant to submit a complete application. Is that your motion or is that mine? I'm accepting it as your motion. Well, I, I want to hear other comments. I, I want to hear other comments from other board members, but, but you know, before I make the motion, I'm, I'm throwing it out to the board so that they can make comments, and I'm not throwing it out to the public for, for comments from the public. I think just as a, a point for the benefit of the applicants, um, the rules that we enacted tonight um, really are just saying that we have the authority to table it, and it's something that we've exercised in the past. The application that they received um, 
I don't see the date they received it, but as part of their application for the conditional accessory, conditional use accessory dwelling unit, they received a list of things that they had to submit, and it does say on that as well um, as the, similarly in the, the rules we passed tonight, but mm -hmm. it says on the application they received at the time they went to see Bruce for the first time was that the failure to meet these requirements allows us to table it. Um, so I just, for their benefit, I don't want them to think that we're changing rules tonight and making them. No. No. Um, so what, we're, what we would be doing is um, really enforcing something that they had knowledge of when they received the first application. And I do agree that it would be helpful to have a little more information here based on the yeah. things that they originally were told should be provided, including the setbacks, measurements, and a site plan. I think with respect to the last comment you had, um, I think the, the applicants probably could tell us today what they, how they plan to use it. So I'm less concerned about that one, but I am more concerned about the, the measurements and the diagrams and the survey. Um, so I, I do think we could take into consideration how much they can tell us tonight, but I think there's some information <coughs> on number two that is lacking, that really we need the benefit of paper to see it and review it and to touch it. Um, so I wish we could go forth, but unfortunately, we do need to see some more things, in my view. But, you know, just in defense of, of, of the applicant, uh, I probably should have asked for more of a site plan, but because everything was existing and with the, with the photo, <coughs> um, I guess I didn't push as, as hard as, as I probably should have. Uh, so really, probably the blame is more on on the code ops than it is the applicant in this particular case. Well, in, the condition has existed in its present state for how long? Well, it's been, she's owned it since, they've owned it for five years anyways, and, it was in, and I don't know how long before that. There so there, so there, my, my point simply being presumably another month or so isn't going to no. there is no, a, be of, of, like of prejudice to you or anybody else. There is a letter in the application that does explain the situation that does say that that it is an existing situation because you said you hadn't found anything, but there is one in there. No, and I got the sense when I was uh, reviewing it that that was the case. I understood that was the intent, and I'm comfortable with that. Um, I think this is different than a situation where you want to start building and that you right. need to go ahead. Certainly, um, Mr. Smith isn't going to be enforcing anything against you given the situation. Right. It's a hassle to come back out here, but certainly you understand we need to have certain information. I understand that. I'm, I guess I don't understand what information we didn't supply, that, okay. because I think we did supply everything we were asked for, that the application mm. asked for. Well, I think that um, <coughs> Mr. Smith can help guide you through uh, the materials to be submitted for the next uh, hearing. Okay. It's really not that much uh, more, but just to know. Can we have a formal motion? For, or, I have a question. Uh, it's my understanding that the applicants approached you, Bruce, in regards to replacing the septic system only. That's true. At that point, I'm trying to assemble the details. A bedroom count was made, and, and it was identified that one of the bedrooms had an associated kitchen, and this is what triggered the accessory uh, unit the, the, uh, the site evaluation that was done for the septic system, <clears throat> the design itself, what they call the HHG 200 form, indicated that it was an ex a dwelling unit and with, a, with an apartment, uh, which, which immediately put me on alert that I needed to check the records to make sure everything was correct, uh, was legal. And that's when we picked up that there was indeed a building permit, but it wasn't allowed to have the facilities to, have, to be able to function independently from the main dwelling unit. It, the that's kitchen being associated with one of the that's bedrooms. True. That's correct. And how the primary house had how many bedrooms, not counting the, the excess I dwelling? I didn't bring the septic system design. Four, with me. I have that if you'd like it. Okay. Four in the primary house mm -hmm. with the with accessory one. dwelling being the fifth? Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it, are these related in the sense that? Could they design and install a septic system, an engineered septic system, to accommodate five bedrooms and 
address the accessory, accessory dwelling unit as a separate issue. If, in, and I'm looking at this in the sense of their reason for their primary application is to replace a, a potentially failing septic system. Uh, I, I don't know how urgent this is. It may, well, it may not be urgent. The permit's been issued here regardless of whether the approval for the, the accessory dwelling unit is, is going in. They, will, they, are, they are willing to put in a, a system that will handle the five bedrooms. So it, it, the, the accessory dwelling unit is secondary to the fact that the septic system is failing uh, and it's going to be replaced and the permit's been issued. It's just this is a, a formality to clean up and allow for something that's already been um, going on, providing the board sees that it meets the conditions. So, so you it's, can it, it, I've, I've already separated the septic system from this issue as far as, as, far as taking care of the malfunction. So you can, you, you can or have approved the septic I system? To, I have approved the septic system with five bedrooms. So our tabling does not delay the That's septic correct. Se system at all? Okay. Uh, that was my desire, is not to delay the septic system. I, uh, uh, I wasn't clear whether that was dependent upon our uh, tabling of this issue tonight. Does the number of kitchens influence the size of the septic system at all? No, not necessarily. It's based on the uh, design flow for the total number of bedrooms, although, although sometimes, depending on the situation, they'll, add a, they'll, they'll put in a, a, a safety factor sometimes in the gallons of flow because there's two units. Uh, but the code just addresses mainly the number of bedrooms, 90 gallons per day per bedroom. Mr. Fristasi, <coughs> would you like to make a motion? <coughs> Okay, but I, I also want to make a comment after I make a motion or a have a couple questions answered for the benefit of the, of the applicant. Uh, I would make a motion that this, uh, the application of Michael and Lee Wilson of uh, 82 Two Lights Road, Cape Elizabeth be um, postponed or tabled, excuse me, tabled until the next regularly scheduled meeting of the zoning board to allow the applicants to complete the application uh, that uh, we deem incomplete this evening. Do we have a second? A second. Any further discussion? Comments? Question. Is this being occupied right now? Yes, it is. This was purchased five years ago. Purchased five years ago, that's correct. All right, and it was done with, through a bank, a mortgage survey, and normally they pick that stuff up, whether it's a, a legal two-family or an accessory building or not. One would assume so. So this was done, okay. Um, I have a concern about a second means of egress also. I didn't see it on the plan. I would like to see something like that, Bruce, when they make their application. Uh, this is above a, a, a barn area, and I'm assuming that there may be cars stored in the garage, so could you also make sure that it is, uh, there is this fire code? There may not. There's okay, not well, I'm, not, I'm asking to see that in the, in the application. Well, uh, next. W will you talk at exits or egress? I mean, there's, there may only be one exit, but there, are, there, are, there is a second means of egress. Uh, I think I'd like to have something from you saying that you're satisfied with, with uh, the second means of egress from the building, um, where it is a second floor building and above an area where there might be automobiles and that it's properly uh, sheetrocked, whatever it might be. I'm putting you on the, <laughs> I'm just concerned because we don't have a control. The, the property is there now, it's, it's built. You're saying there's no building permit, but yet it's being occupied. It'd be different if it was not occupied and they, would, and they were making the changes. You would ensure that they were done properly. Right. But at this point, you've lost control. I say you, your office has lost control of this. And I'm saying at this particular time, this is the only way that we can ensure that the safety, fire and safety uh, conditions have been met. 
And I, and I appreciate that concern, but that's, I mean, that's just one of many issues that, that has to be looked at. And, and if the board did approve the application, I would do a walkthrough and do a certificate for an accessory dwelling unit based on the condition of use permit that was approved by the, by the board. Uh, so rest assured that there would be a walkthrough at some point after the, as soon as the, as the board decided that this was approved. Um, because the condition of use permit authorizes that, that that's only the first step in, in taking that next step to make sure that because even though it's a, a use that's been in existence, it's now a use that the town recognizes legal for the purposes of conditional use permit. And I, I do have to take that the, the one step further and, and make sure that it, it meets the standards. Well, that's just it. Uh, we, this was changed several years ago, the, uh, or the privilege to have an accessory unit. And supposedly it was done to, to accommodate uh, in-laws, uh, mothers, fathers, whatever it might be. Um, friends. Very close friends very close friends. Um, and I know that we have a lot of Ill illegal accessory dwellings, and this is not the first one that's come before the board since I've been on the board. We may have some illegal apartments. That's what I'm saying, we have illegal, well, it's even worse. <laughs> that's even worse, so uh, I, I think that we should, we should be very careful before we rubber stamp something that it meets the, the fire and safety uh, codes. We have a motion before us. All those in favor? Opposed? None. Uh, motion is approved on a vote of uh, five in favor, zero opposed. And um, Mr. and Mrs. Wilson, your application is tabled until the next regularly scheduled board meeting. Um, and I would encourage you um, at least 14 days before the next meeting to provide uh, Mr. Smith with all the information required to complete your application so he in turn can provide the information to the board members so we will have it prior to uh, the next board meeting. What is the next board meeting? Yeah, we, we need to bring that forth now because... Well, the next board meeting would put us uh, right around Christmas. <laughs> and we had determined that we would meet the third Tuesday instead of the fourth Tuesday, but that's planning board. So this room is taken. So we're going to have to do something different. Can we meet on a day other than Tuesday? The day before, the day after? That, that what you said? Any yeah. other day of we the week? Can meet, you can meet at another day as long as it's announced, yes. Okay. Come back Monday. Your the Mondays I'm occupied for the next several weeks. <laughs> I've been... Uh, invited to participate in a number of uh, discussions at South Portland. <laughs> we would not want to keep you from those. Um, a Wednesday, is the room occupied on Wednesday evenings? I, we, I didn't check Wednesday, I did check Monday because I didn't think that was going to be a problem. But. We can tentatively do the 20th and then if there's a problem, um, would you authorize me to make a change? Sure. You, but for the benefit of the Wilsons, that Mrs. Wilson was asking when the next board meeting would be, tentatively we're looking at the third Wednesday, 20th. the 20th of December, as a tentative date. Subject to change. <laughs> if this room is otherwise being used. We can do it uh, at the following meeting in January. Uh, I, we had planned that I got a company for supplies. At the following meeting in January? Uh, no, well, we can. January might be safer. Yeah. That would work. Right there, there's. <laughs> we have a request to attend the Christmas party. <laughs> <laughs> sure. That would, that would um, there's certainly no obligation on your part to submit the materials for a December meeting. If you submit them for January's meeting, it'll be heard in January. So uh, the matter is tabled until the next regularly scheduled meeting or until you submit the completed application.
well, let's let's but no later then. I think we need we did. We we should probably do January. We shouldn't leave it open. All right, because it is an issue that needs to be. Okay, prepared. well then let's table it until the January meeting. Is that I I think I'd have to uh, amend my motion then. I said to the next schedule Re meeting, then uh, I would um, amend my motion to be the next uh, the um, January meeting to accommodate the Wilsons. And will you accept the amendment of the motion with a second? Absolutely. All those in favor of the motion as amended? The amended motion is approved and the application is continued until the January meeting. <clears throat> the January meeting date, Bruce. 23rd. It will not be here. The next item on the agenda is the second item of new business to hear the appeal of Craig and Jennifer Cooper, 150 Ocean House Road, tax map U25, lot 13, for a left sideline variance of 15 feet, zero inches from the required 25 feet, zero inches to replace an existing garage with a new garage and family room slash office at 10 feet, zero inches from the property line. <laughs> Do we have Craig or Jennifer Cooper? I assume this is Craig, Craig Cooper. I think <coughs> if I could state one thing for the record before it becomes an issue, building permits for variance or a, a, a variance isn't always accompanied by a building permit denial. An applicant has two ways to go to the board. He can he can apply for a permit and get denied and take that denial for a variance, or he can automatically go for the board for a variance. So there isn't always a building permit. So I just thought I'd bring that up. That's why there isn't a building permit accompanying this application. Yeah, that's why I don't have a building permit. So we can't table this one, too. Very good. Thank you, Ken. But a good many times they'll apply, and then I'll find the problem, deny it, and then they'll, 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 be, they'll understand their options. Somebody like Mr. Cooper, who, who's a contractor, knows the process somewhat better than, than maybe somebody that doesn't deal with the town. Um, he knew that he had to get a variance automatically. Um, Mr. Cooper, you are here for a variance under section 192 B1 of the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance, which is uh, a variance uh, based on uh, what we have come to refer to as the practical difficulty standard for granting a variance. Um, and we will permit you to um, present whatever evidence you would like in support of your application. We do have uh, submitted to us um, what at least uh, appears to be um, a fairly complete um, application with a table of contents um, numbered, which we thank you for. Um, that's very helpful for us. Um, we will want to ask you questions um, either as you go or at the conclusion of your presentation to satisfy ourselves that all of the various elements of the ordinance have been met. Um, if all of the ordinance, all of the elements of the ordinance have not been met, or we determine that all of them have not been met, um, we will be required under the ordinance to deny the application. Um, and we will undoubtedly, at the, at the close of your presentation, discuss among ourselves all of those various elements to satisfy ourselves that they have been met. Um, and I assume that you are here by yourself without anybody else to make a presentation since I don't see anybody else in the room. That is correct. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, while well, the application is for myself and my wife, my wife is at home with the children and probably constituting the larger part of the television audience this evening, watching us from afar. Uh, 
uh, you have before you, as you mentioned, a 29-page uh, packet, which I tried to be as specific as possible in answering all the questions and requirements. I'll give you some general information and review through that with you. Please feel free to interrupt me as we go along, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions during and, uh, and after the general presentation. Some of the information that is not contained in this, and just to, again, to give you some more of the, the overall general situation, obviously I have a non-conforming lot here, one of the larger lots in the immediate area of the neighborhood. My present lot size there in lot number 13 is 43,560 square feet. By code, since I am on my own septic, private septic system, we're allowed to cover no more than 20% of that lot. On public sewer, it would be 25% because I have a private septic system, which is a part of the problem in uh, locating uh, accessory buildings on here is the private septic system. My, uh, my requirement is to stay within 20%. Calculations I've presented before you show you that I now cover only 9% well under that 20% of my uh, present property. And the new garage and accessory dwelling, and, and since I'm going to uh, connect it to the building is what I'm proposing <coughs> to do here, increases that by 1%. I will, my total ground coverage of square footage will be 10% of that 43,560, exactly half of what is allowable in that regard. While I do have a 43,000 square foot lot, which is a good size for the immediate areas, part of the problems here uh, that present itself with the existing building and the fact that I want to replace that, that building is that immediately behind it is my existing septic system, a raised bed chamber system. And to the uh, immediately behind my dwelling is the pump station for that. And <coughs> from the footprint of my existing house to the footprint of the garage, is almost a four foot change in elevation. Uh, the garage is lower than the house by approximately four feet. And between the two is the most common thing in Cape Elizabeth, a ledge, solid ledge. And so what I'm proposing to do here in general this evening is to remove 2,000 square feet of existing building and replace it with 2,000 square feet of new building. I date myself a little bit when I admit that one of the reasons I need to do this is the, the existing roof on this garage needs replacing. I put the existing roof on this new garage for the former owner, Fred Fillinger, when he lived in Cape Elizabeth and owned this house before I bought it, back in probably 1979 or 1980. The foundation is also in bad condition. The building itself is a what I would classify as a typical rural main add-on garage, 1940s, 19, late 1930s through mid-1940s circuit time frame for these structures, which kind of, they put an addition on wherever it was, uh, that's the irregular shape of the existing garage, which is in some of the information that is there for you. What I'm proposing to do is to tear that down and build a three-car garage connected to the house in such a fashion that my wife can park her car inside for the first time in 16 years since we've lived there and walk inside the house in the rain. Uh, the garage structure itself, the three bays, is designed to look a little more like a barn and be more in keeping with the what I have done to the home. Nine years ago, I remodeled the entire house and changed the exterior of it. And right now, when I, uh, 16 years ago, when I bought the <coughs> property, I covered the existing garage with vinyl siding, and uh, you know it's just relatively ugly, and I'd like to improve upon that with matching the siding and the shingling on my house uh, in general. You quoted here that, in fact, that Article 5 of the Zoning Board of Appeals in Section 19-5-2, this is what we're here before this evening. Um, the reason I'm here before you is because in, in meeting with Bruce and realizing that a uh, a building permit to do this, I would still be within my 25-foot setbacks that I needed to be here. Um, I'd just like to quote that in paragraph B1C on the second page, page 47 of that article, um, if you decide to grant this variance, it says that no variance shall be granted 
to either reduce a setback to less than 10 feet or the shortest non-conforming setback distance created by the existing building. My existing garage sits exactly five feet off my existing property line. What I'm proposing to do this evening is to change that, even though your variance allows you to let me uh, stay within five feet, I'm proposing that we build back at that 10 feet. And, that, and, and that's a critical measurement for me because of the ledge, the septic system, et cetera, and to get the three bays in the garage, which I would like, which will still maintain basically the same square footage that I presently have, squeezing everything virtually as far away um, as I can. So I'm proposing to increase my setback, even though I'm asking for it to be 10 feet from the property line, I'm increasing it from five. Um, at this time, I'd just like to go through the 29-page packet and show you several things on it. Uh, in it, explain a few of the, uh, the pages, obviously, and I know that we we'll probably will discuss some of this. The first three pages are the application for variance itself. Um, page four and five are letters from my immediate abutters on either side. First one from Penny. Penny, my next door neighbor. She is the person who sits closest to this garage. Her, <coughs> her house is probably six feet from my property line. My garage is five feet from that. <coughs> I met with these neighbors and showed them the packet that you have before you, sat with them, explained what I was doing, offered for them to walk around the property with me, and, uh, and henceforth they uh, wrote this letter. Penny very much thinks that she certainly is the one, as I say, is extremely close to this project and is in a complete um, approval of having that done. As are the Hurleys, which are on the other side, closer to my home, and on that side, we're not anywhere near even the 25-foot setback um, required by code. But they were nice enough to write me a letter as well. I did meet with... Um, Betty and John across the street from me on lot number two. They, again, did not write a letter, but gave me their verbal approval and wanted me to be able to use their name uh, this evening, as well as uh, Michelle and John Bouchard, who live on lot number 17E immediately behind me. Um, they also gave me their verbal approval and said that I could use their name this evening. I got an interesting phone call from a David Merrill at number 130 Ocean House Road when he received the mailing that has to be put out. He called and said, you know, I've driven by your house, I see your present garage and I have no problem with you improving upon it. He said you can use my name uh, in this hearing uh, this evening as well. Um, I spoke with Sandy Larley on lot number 15. That's two, ho two house lots away uh, to my right. She also gave me her verbal approval. I tried to meet with Elizabeth Wood on lot number 11, two lots to the left, left her message on her answering machine and told them she did not respond, but I took that as a positive rather than a negative, told her that what was happening here this evening and what I was going through. So I, in addition to putting this pack together, tried to go canvassing the immediate neighborhood of people most immediately uh, <coughs> just, uh, you know, affected by this. They all felt that it would be an improvement to the neighborhood and to their property value as well. Page six, seven, and eight are the uh, detailed, six being a detailed floor plan. And again, these would be, these, these plans are here for your use this evening and with approval, of course, uh, and needing to go to a, apply for a building permit, I would have to have foundation plans and section plans, but I thought that this met the requirement of uh, dimensions and size. See on the floor plan, I'm proposing to attach a mud room to the house, which uh, is drastically needed by the kids. Uh, but the garage is the issue that we'll see when we address the, uh, the site plans. Uh, page seven is an elevation from both the side and the front of the uh, barn like effect that I'm trying to create with the garage. <coughs> page eight is a rear elevation as well as a minor section through there and showing the uh, attachment of the mudroom area to the house. Page nine is kind of a colored <coughs> description here for you. 
and that if you can follow, excuse me, a light dotted line here is the irregular shape of the existing garage, where this one leg sticks out quite a bit forward, which is mostly uh, orange at this point. And uh, what I'm proposing here is to, you know, the darker shaded area is, is the new footprint of the all new buildings. A lot of it mirror imaging the exact location of the existing garage, removing the front of the existing garage and regaining that square footage by literally pushing back into my property, uh, which really goes right up against as far as I can go with the septic system behind it. The orange is the area <coughs> I am proposing to remove from existing non-conforming space. The yellow is existing space that is now in non-conforming that will stay. And the green is why I'm here this evening. Really, this is the, re the request, is that, I, that that is new footprint space in non-conforming, in a non-conforming setback, but it is 10 feet Actually, in fact, the 10-foot mark is at the yellow front corner. It's the angle on my lot. The side of the garage itself is 14 feet off of the side setback, but the closest point is the front corner. And we see that on, a, on, the, on the next site plan, but it's, the 10-foot mark is the corner of the yellow, and it's 10 feet from this angle. This is not specifically <coughs> to scale here, but for your you know, visuals of, of, the, of the color area here. And my understanding of the building codes and in meeting with Bruce is that I have the ability in a grandfather situation here to build a new garage in exactly the same footprint because this has been existing. Um, as long as I don't go higher and et cetera, et cetera, but it's, it's exactly in the same footprint that I can apply for a building print and, bu and, and build a new garage. But I propose that the shape of that is not conducive to making it satisfactory for that, that, that's not financially feasible, it's, it's ugly, I'm trying to improve, and I think I can improve a non-conforming situation here by moving back even 10 feet more. And in fact, you can see the calculation in the lower here. Right now, if you add up all of the orange and yellow, which is the <coughs> non-conforming footprint as it exists today, I have 776 square feet of garage space in non-conforming. When you subtract the orange, keeping the yellow and adding the green, the new non-conforming space will be 550 square feet, which is actually an improvement of 25%. I will be reducing, and proposing here to reduce my non-conforming existing footprint by 25%, and I'm also proposing to double the setback from five feet to 10 feet uh, if, you, you know, if you approve this this evening. Page 10 is a sketch plan I had done by a surveyor to uh, hopefully you know, to give you as accurate uh, as possible here <coughs> as, as per your requirements. And I had them concentrate on the, on the corner. I mean, I heard Joe ask about um, dimensions from other buildings this evening, et cetera. And I, I must admit that this sketch plan, while very accurate from the, from the surveyors, we just did concentrate on that front corner. And it's here that they show us the five foot to 10 foot change in that garage, which I've more graphically shown in the color uh, scenario on page nine. I happen to have with me this evening my site plan from 1991 when I had my house remodeled, and I do know the distances from my house to the houses around me if that is of an issue here this evening. Um, and I happen to know the distances from the side, as I mentioned this evening, was 14 feet, but I concentrated on that five foot and 10 foot corner for you. Um, page 11 is the, uh, the, the, is the map, the um, tax map, and, a, and a, not a very good picture, but it, the picture in the bottom left is the garage as I bought it 16 years ago and the house as I bought it 16 years ago. And page 12 just happens to be my deed because I was trying to su su substantiate the site plan information for you as accurately as possible with the demand <coughs> as in my deed. Mr. C Mr. Cooper, as as yes. fine a job as you're doing walking us through this, and we appreciate that. <laughs> I don't want you to feel that you need to walk us through okay. each document as you've submitted. I think most of them um, are very well presented and speak for themselves. 
as to, okay. I mean, to what you've given us. After 29 pages, I just didn't want to, you know, I... <laughs> but, but, but <laughs> again, to, to the extent really. that there's anything that you felt needed particular explanation, we're certainly sure. glad to receive that. Okay. But I didn't want you to feel compelled to go through page by page and tell us what, what each item well, you, you, Obviously, you know what they are, but after Joe's comments on the, on the dimensions, I wanted to be sure to go through those site plans a little more accurately. Obviously, the rest of the packet does speak for itself. Uh, uh, page 13 and 14, artist renditions of a front and back view. Uh, they're directly related to the photographs which follow. Um, you know, the photographs of the existing house and then the photographs of the existing garage. Uh, the rendition of, uh, on page 13 actually relates to the top photo on page 17 as kind of a before and after scenario. <coughs> photograph as an improvement. Um, as does the back, the top page of 18, and that other uh, rendition. And then the ledge is obvious on page 19. You can see uh, there's actually a stone wall there, but the ledge, and that somewhat shows the four foot elevation change. That's one of the limitations here. I know that one of your concerns is uh, could I have placed this garage elsewhere, gotten it on the lot, or done something uh, to have changed that? Uh, the tax map showing 80. 80 house lots is only which are non-conforming. They're out of this 80 lots. There are eight of them that might be conforming today. And then the photographs of the neighborhood, because Bruce asked me to su submit the fact the neighborhoods, and I've, on the very last page, shown uh, to my best ability a number of neighbors who suffer from the same problem, problem as I do as being too close to their property lines. Um, Virtually every house there is not conforming in the front with a 50-foot setback. That does not play a part with us here. It's really only the back. The side setback was the back of my property. So I, in so doing, I've somewhat shortened my presentation. But I think, uh, as you say, the photographs somewhat speak for themselves. I'd be happy to answer any and all questions. Questions by the board for Mr. Cooper? Mr. Keneally. Um, I'd like to just go through a couple of the criteria that we have to apply and, and get yes. your input on that. I think some of the information may be here, but maybe it's not gathered together. Um, the practical difficulty uh, has a significant economic injury aspect to it. Uh, and significant economic injury is defined as placing the applicant at a disadvantage with respect to, uh, to neighbors. Um, and I don't want to read, well, I will read the whole thing. Disadvantage in the neighborhood by applying zoning ordinance standards which would prevent the applicant from having a structure or accessory structure comparable in size, location, and number to those of other lot owners in the immediate neighborhood, but in no case fewer than 10 of the nearest property owners. Um, from what I could see so far, it looks like most of the accessory buildings, garages, and so forth in the nearest 10 houses are much smaller than what you're proposing here. I don't, are there any other three car garages, for instance, in the, among the 10 nearest houses? Um, there's, there is a uh, building that has two garages, but no, there are not as many, no. Okay. Um, so the rules are that we This may be the only three car garage is an existing <coughs> three car garage. No, but right, but I'm just, yeah. the, the, the uh, criteria that we have to strictly uh, uh, apply here are uh, that uh, you have ten of the ten of the nearest property owners have to have property comparable to what you're proposing here. In order for us to say there's a significant economic economic injury associated with this, a significant economic injury in denying the uh, application from the uh, building, you know, in the existing footprint does not apply. I mean, in the, well, in the state. Uh, unfortunately, we have to go by what. Practical, practical difficulty definition is that we are uh, considering a variance for. And the practical difficulty is defined as resulting in significant economic injury. And that is defined as the way I just wrote it previously. So that's the only definition that we have to work with. That what you're applying for um, is comparable in size, location, and number to those of other lot owners in the immediate neighborhood, but in no case fewer than 10. I mean, I, I probably have the biggest garage in the neighborhood. I mean, it's one of the reasons I bought the house. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, is that a catch-22 in that in that regard? By having the biggest lot garage in the neighborhood, I can't, you know. 
And I just keep it. I, mean, I, I understand what you're saying as well, and, and Bruce and I, Bruce and I went over this, yeah. and we're trying to give you as, as complete a package here as possible, and and photographing literally all of the houses within the ten. And I appreciate that was, it was an outstanding application. They all have that setback, but nobody has as big a garage. You know, there are while there are multiple buildings. Um, when I remodeled the house, you know, I had probably one of the smallest houses in the neighborhood, and when I enlarged the house, I, I wound up making it one of the larger ones, and then other people around me. You know, follow suit, which is what I do as a living for people as well. People increase their mm -hmm. their garages and their houses, mm -hmm. etc. Um, I'm not proposing to make this garage any bigger. I'm proposing to change the shape of its footprint. I understand the complexity. It doesn't, it doesn't right. match. Yeah. There are not ten more three-car garages in my immediate neighborhood. No, there are not. Okay. Um, the other thing, which I think you have information here on, but I'm not sure you've actually provided it in a form that. Uh, we have to deal with on item 4A. Um, uh, we have to talk. We have to decide whether it produces an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood, and that again is very strictly defined as a result of a variance where the structure is larger or closer to the road or property lines than the average of the nearest ten principal structures or in the case of a variance request for an accessory structure, the nearest 10 accessory structures. So uh, I, I see some numbers here in terms of setbacks, but we don't have an average of the 10 nearest ones. Where, where are you reading that from? Well, it's, it's part of um, B1B that says the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. An undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood is a defined phrase or a defined term um, under the definitional sections of the ordinance. And that phrase in the definitions um, on page 17 of the ordinance uh, says the result of a variance where the structure is larger or closer to the road or property lines than the average of the nearest 10 principal structures, or in the case of a variance request for an accessory structure, the nearest 10 accessory structures. Well, on, on, yeah, on, on, I, I tried to address that on page 29. Bruce led me to believe that it was take 10, but it didn't have to be all 10. And I didn't go walking on everybody's property. Uh, and again, I, I, uh, I referred to the, to, the, to the plot plans for those 80 lots within close proximity of me that the 25 foot setbacks on the sides and 50 foot in the back you need only drive by the street to realize that most of those houses do, are, are not closer and I took the ones that immediately around me lot 10, lot 11, lot 12, lot 14, 15 and 35 and some of those people are 6 to 8, 10 to 12 feet from their lot lines with their existing dwellings. That was. Um, I'm that's trying to address. You have about, I think you have 14 pictures here. We have uh, on this table, you have seven setbacks listed uh, as well as you can probably do. But we have to deal with an average of 10. We have to deal with an average of the 10 nearest structures to you. That's the piece of information that we have to base our decision on. Well, I, I must admit, I thought Bruce thought that this was what would, would fit that criteria. I believe. I mean, if I'm misspeaking, Bruce, please let me know. But he, I, I mean, I would well, have what, 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 what I had told you is what the what I had heard from the board is that that the what board is looking for your application to fit the flavor, if I may say so, of the neighborhood. I think that's what I had gathered at the last meeting, and that's based on the ten nearest, not all necessarily having to meet that, but but a reasonable flavor of the neighborhood being met by your application. And I, and I certainly took pictures of the, the more than the 10 nearest houses I that addressed that. the setbacks of the 10 nearest to me that I thought met that flavor of not, you know, of what they, what they met. And, and there may be a couple of houses within 10 houses of me that are, are within 25 feet, uh, you know, maintain that 25 foot setback. Uh, on the non-conforming lots. And again, I certainly did not go out and get site plans for all of my neighbors, but it was a close proximity. And pacing off at the street and taking photographs, there, 
the neighborhood got to know me pretty well by the time I had done this. Nor, Mr. Cooper, can I think, can you reasonably be expected to go onto your neighbor's property with a tape measure sure. and measure from the edge of their property line to their own home or accessory structure? Right. Um, I, but I think that we, in large part, can sort of eyeball that by driving by the neighborhood, driving by your property, uh, looking at the pictures and getting a sense of our own whether what you're proposing is in conformity with the rest of the neighborhood. And, and the way you Other state that is detrimental to the neighborhood as well. I mean, I have the clear consensus of all of my surrounding neighbors as they don't view it. They view the existing building as somewhat detrimental. I mean, if you've driven by, obviously, I'm sure all of you have driven by and looked at it. You know, I mean, it's while we're all trying to improve our properties, you know, this is a very old, dilapidated building which is going to need major repair, which would be an economical hardship to repair as is, as opposed yeah. to. Yeah, and I, I should add, just so there's no misunderstanding, this no, is something. I'm just stating that. Yeah, and this is something that comes up from time to time is we will have neighbors come in and say, members of the board, we are in favor of what our neighbor is proposing to do. Or they will come in and say, we are opposed to what our neighbor is proposing to do. We won't vote up or down based on whether the neighbors are in favor or opposed to it. If the project is in conformity with the ordinance, we'll grant the variance. If it's not in conformity with the ordinance, we won't grant the variance. Um, and that is um, in spite of whether the neighbors are uh, in favor or opposed to whatever the proposal might, might be. If I can just comment on 4A. In, in looking at the photographs and I think doing the eyeball. Well, just for Mr. Cooper's benefit, he doesn't have a 4A. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. In, in looking at the des undesirable change, the definition, the undesirable change in the character of a neighborhood, and considering whether the result, this variance would create a structure that is larger or closer to the road or the property lines than the average 10 properties, I think if we look at the, the photographs he's given us from pages 23 to page 28, um, I think you can kind of go through it and either s assess whether this is this garage will be larger or it's going to be closer. I think in lot 12, there's a fairly si sizable garage that looks close to the property line. And it's hard to tell, of course, where the property line is in this one because there isn't a house on the other side. Right, it's impossible to tell. Right. So, but I just say it's a larger garage, so that may be not an issue. Lot 14 doesn't appear to have a garage. Lot 9 has a garage. Lot 15 looks like it has a barn-like garage in the back. Again, lot... Yeah, lot 15 is a barn in the back. That would be of similar. Lot 11 has, appears to have a garage in the back, and that appears to be fairly close to the structure on the left. Lot 35 is a huge building, actually. <laughs> it's a big building lot 35 is a, is a very large structure in the back. 18, again, is a large barn-like structure in the back. 10 has a structure in the back, not necessarily large barn-like. 20 and 2 don't appear to have Two is an under beneath the house garage. <coughs> I think anybody going by this area, I noticed that the houses all are, are fairly close to one another. I don't think that this is changing that desire, that change, which would be undesirable in neighborhoods. So I'm less concerned about that. I, I feel that he's satisfied that. Mr. Fristassi. I agree with uh, <coughs> Catherine on that. Um, and a comment was made about an old dilapidated building. Um, unfortunately, maybe fortunately, I've been around for a few years and I've traveled this road for a number of years. And um, these houses have been there a long time. <clears throat> and they have been occupied by older people that have lived in Cape Elizabeth for a number of years. And that is probably why they have been, or they are, are in the condition that they are. But you went through, Kathy, you went through the photographs, and those that have the larger garages have also been remodeled over the past 
10 years, five years or so, and have been upgraded. And I think that's what's happening on this stretch of land. Uh, the properties are changing hands and they have, are being enhanced dramatically. And uh, there's a tremendous improvement in this stretch. And I think that uh, we have to give credit to the homeowners because this is a highly visible stretch of land coming into Cape Elizabeth. And I think it's, it's to the, um, um, well, we should encourage, we should encourage uh, the residents to make improvements that have been proposed to us today. Um, it is to the credit of these homeowners that they have done, that, done so. The zoning, um, and, and, I, and I question this because we've had a number of, of applicants come to us in an RA zone. And basically, they're living on a, on a non-conforming lot. As soon as it's classified RA, and any changes, uh, they're forced to come to us. And I'm not talking just on this stretch of land, uh, out to uh, Fort, Way, um, excuse me, um, um, Crescent Beach area. Uh, all those properties are all RA zones on 100 by 100 foot lots, maybe even smaller. And I don't know who classified that area RA. Uh, but they must have done it without looking at the property sizes and the consequences on the homeowners. So in defense of, of this applicant, uh, I think he should be commended in, in what he wants to do, but it's in line with what other people have done on this stretch of land and uh, the stretch of road, and, and I applaud him, and I applaud the other people that have made substantial changes. So definitely it's, it's, in, it's in keeping with the character of the neighborhood now where it's changing, the changing of the God, if you want to say that. Uh, so I, I, I am in favor of, of this portion of it, or uh, I would vote yes on that. One question I do have for Craig is uh, the location of the septic system. What is the distance of this new proposed building from the septic system? I don't, um, I don't encringe upon uh, the, the toe of the, of the slope of the, uh, of the raised bed. Right. To where um, the, uh, I believe the back corner of the garage. You know, I'd actually have to dig up to the corner to find out where the, lo the closest chamber is. But as a raised chamber, you know, I have a have an elevated hill in the backyard. Part of it leveled off, and uh, there's probably a three to one slope uh, to the to the lowest spot where I'm back. I, I really have not encringed upon the footprint of the septic system at all. I've stayed on virgin ground outside right. of that. Well, that, in reviewing the application, that was, that was a concern that I had. So I'll, I'll defer that question to the uh, CEO, we no longer the building inspector. Uh, uh, Bruce, uh, what, how far back should he be from that, that septic system? And are you comfortable with the plan that, it, that actually uh, meets that, that, that setback? That's something that we'll have to take a look at before issuance of a building permit to make sure the distances are, are substantial enough to to not hinder the function of that septic system and if, the need, and if there's a need for to file a variance through uh, for an, on an HHE 200 form, which is a site evaluation uh, for an after the fact, and that if that's approved, then he'll get his building permit if that need is, exists. And where does so that we didn't We didn't study the distance to that septic system. I don't believe do you have a system design or that is all? No, that was an existing system. Um, you know, but I mean, I, I could locate that corner of the, of the septic system. What is the setback there, Bruce? Do you know? Well, for a system to go in adjacent to, uh, for replacement, you can be as close as 10 feet. Um, I mean, I believe that three to one slopes are good 12 to 15 feet. Well, that, that's a concern that I have. And, sure. and uh, you know, I think that uh, Bruce is going to have to, to look at it. Now, right. if you're closer than 10 feet, what happens? And if you don't get if out of the plumbing code, it, it, it's 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 kind of a gray area in 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 that if a building's already existing and they're replacing the system, it's clear that you can be. I can grant a variance through the plumbing code through my office down to at least as close as I believe five feet. But to reverse that situation, have an existing system, septic system, and put a building adjacent to it. Common Code doesn't really address that. Uh, so it's a, it's a gray enough area so that how I handle it, that if it becomes a problem, 
we may have to have, have uh, an after the fact or, or variance done on paperwork to <coughs> creep that building close, provided it doesn't, doesn't hurt the septic system. It's not an easy situation because there's no clear guidance in the plumbing code. It, it only addresses septic systems replacing existing buildings, not buildings going in to, a, to an existing septic system. It's always been a gray area. And so what I've generally done in the past is make sure that it didn't cringe upon it and it was a comfortable enough distance to know that the system wasn't going to malfunction because, because we were cutting into the toe or actually into the bed of that <coughs> system. Your, your, your consensus is that to the toe, it's 10 to 12 feet, correct? Which means to, to the actual bed, we can talk, we could talk another 10 feet. So it sounds, you know, to me like it's a comfortable distance, but we can verify that. Clearly, if I apply for a building permit and get, you know, after, which would come after getting your approval this evening, that would be one of the criteria that I'll, I'll have to meet, you know. Um, to satisfy Bruce that I have, I have met that. I will tell you that the replacement of a new garage here is going to dramatically improve the, uh, the echo system of runoff here and water, et cetera, because I'll be doing, you know, I'll have frost walls in as opposed to <coughs> add slabs, et cetera, and, and be able to divert water more proportionate to what we would do with new construction, as you were saying, as we improve these things. And I know that that's one of the issues around septic systems and how close you go to it and how, how it is affected at this time. So, I mean, this septic system is my backyard. It's where my children play. I will want to make sure that it's all, you know, very appropriately done. That was, <coughs> that was the... Uh, basically the only note that I made on the application when I uh, was reviewing this. Could I'd like to, uh, like to respond to you, Joe. I would have said everything you said exactly as you said it as a preface to what I said, except I didn't want to take too long. The problem I have is despite everything that you said and despite the fact that he's actually reducing the nonconformity by 35 percent roughly, um, we have to deal with these criteria. <coughs> And I would like to see uh, the CEO um, make sure that each applicant provides us a more complete set of information relative to these two semi-quantitative criteria, because these are the two most difficult things that we have to make our decision based upon. And I think in this case, as in the case, another case that we dealt with recently, there were other circumstances that allowed us to approve it. But we do have to deal with these criteria. And we sit here as a quasi-judicial body making a decision based on specifically defined criteria. Um, and I'm not sure that we have the information provided to us in the form that we need it uh, in this case to actually make a decision based on these criteria. <laughs> that having been said, I, I agree with everything you said. This is a major improvement to both the property in the neighborhood and to the, if you will, to the entrance into Cape Elizabeth on Route 77. And I certainly respect the fact that the applicant is reducing the non-conforming area uh, by about one-third. So I think those are both uh, major factors in our decision-making. I don't know, though, what else he could provide us, uh, short of, I mean, he gave us the photographs of the 10 lo neighboring houses. Um, but short of getting a site plan for each one, which is something I don't think he can do and would be very expensive. I'm not sure how much more information he can obtain from the 10 property owners, aside from calling them here. Mr. Cooper, on page 29 of your submission, where did you get the side setbacks for the various lots that are listed? That, that was my approximation of walking the street. I had an iron pin at my house. As a contractor, I know my pace very well. Uh, you know, I walked <coughs> to the next corner, what appeared to be from everything from where I, I, I spoke to the, the new, the, to the two adjacent neighbors and looked for what they had for pins. But, so these are, uh, page 29, these are your These are my best, approximate, best, right. best, the best of my ability, right. visual from the street. Right. So, so you had some ability to do that. What, I'm, so what we're required to look at is the average of 10. You've given us your best estimate of seven. I went for all the ones that were less. I mean, when you say for the average of 10, what I should have included here were the ones that probably meet the, a larger setback then. I was looking for those that were closest to my 
10 well, it's the foot, nearest, it's the nearest five 10. Foot, yeah. It's the nearest 10 that you have to deal with. Yeah, and, and these, well, again. So, so um, it, would, it would be cleaner for us if you had given us the average of 10 rather than a list of seven. I'm not sure whether those seven are among the nearest 10 or not. Uh, they, they pretty much are. They, okay. These are the closest, uh, you know, even though lot number 35 is a, a much bigger number, it's only four or five houses away from me. Are there other questions for Mr. Cooper? Dr. Chapman. <clears throat> I think you stated this. Penelope Kenny, was she lot 12 or She's 4? lot 12. The, uh, lot 12. the postage stamp lot immediately beside me, the one that's in the closest proximity to this building. John Hurley was lot 14. I think that is correct. Okay. Uh, the existing structure is one story, and your proposed is Two story. Story, well, it's a story and a half, that's correct, with the square footage. And the, yeah. you show it as loft above and mezzanine above. What's the intended use of the uh, storage height? Storage. Storage. Yeah. No. If I put my vehicles inside, I mean, the, the footprint is the same size now, but I can't park inside my garages, much like many people who I build garages for. So my, no, my hope is to be able to actually park my vehicles in the garage and then store the things in the loft above that are now on the presently on the lower level. Right now, it's a one-car garage. Or? No, it actually has three different garage doors to it now: two on the lower level and one on the upper level. If you look at the photographs, yeah. And and there so are three, there are three bays <coughs> in which you could pull vehicles if you. These aren't necessarily intended for bedrooms or uh, and no well, absolutely not. Above. No. Okay. And the. Uh, regarding these two site plans, yes, which there there is a discrepancy between the two as far as the side lines, which is yeah, no, you you have a, you have a surveyor site plan, the larger of the two, you know that is uh, is this the dominant site plan? That is correct. Okay, it, that is the one that proposes the the other one is more of a visual uh, showing those color changes and proportionate of the of the change, but the well, I'm I'm asking foot. that question in view of the fact that on the larger survey. Uh, site plan. You yes. show the existing as, as well as proposed left sideline being one and the same, where on your colored inversion you show a, a difference uh, in the proposed and existing being this orange band. That, that, that is correct. There is a six inch difference which in this in this one fiftieth scale doesn't show up on the side. Um, in this, those lines are not exactly on top of each other, but it's a much smaller scale. And, and the, the colored version was more of a, a visual for you, but the square footage change of 700 feet to 500 feet came from, the, this, that information came from the survey. As you see, it's written in small up here. Right, so my proposal, the, the, the change of, a, of the color. The, the left sideline. Correct. The north sideline is virtually one and the same <coughs> uh, well, there, between the pro proposed and existing. It, it is I mean, on the left sideline in, in by the surveyor's rule that changed the left sideline changed six inches. Six inches? Yes, further away. Granted, the orange and yellow colors that I gave you show that as, as a larger and was more just of a, a, a visual. It got drawn before this one and, and was clearly not as accurate. So the five to ten foot change, the reduction by almost thirty percent of the of the square footage came from the surveyor's information. Okay. So, so this the, fourteen uh, that's the fourteen foot plus measurement that I that I that I recited to you is the side setback. The, that it's fourteen foot to fourteen foot six. Okay. But I, I was concentrating on that closest point, five and ten. Right. Mm. But the the vertical sideline on this is virtually unchanged between the proposed. It has changed six inches, I say, but you can't see that in this one to 50th scale. I mean, if you really get a magnifying glass out, it's, it's very so, minor. And, so, and clearly my, my color rendition makes that six inches look bigger. You're right. So the five feet, five foot change from 10 feet proposed to five feet is not the left sideline, but it's that lower left corner, that diagonal corner. Correct. But still is a sideline. 
That is considered a sideline. Right, I understand that, that, but it's not it's the, the closest point was what the, I was told to concentrate on. Instead of the, the whole side moving in five feet, it's this corners moving up five feet. Right. Okay. But the whole, and the whole front of the building is being removed. That's, the major, that's where the major reduction is. Okay. Other questions for Mr. Cooper? Um, seeing no one else to speak in favor or against the proposal, we will close the public comment portion of the hearing and open the matter for further discussion by the board. Thank you. Discussion beyond what we've had so far? I do have one comment. Um, we've talked about the size of this garage in comparison to the size of the current existing garage. And I just am thinking about it. And even though that the garage that Mr. Cooper proposes to build is considerably larger, the portion of it that would be non-conforming isn't all that much higher. It's only five feet of the existing garage. When you look at the diagram, which would be seven, page seven of his, um, I don't have the exact measurements of the height, but I really don't, I suspect it's not that much higher than the portion of the garage now. The pitches of the roofs are different, but I, I think that it's not so egregious such that um, it shouldn't make us. I can address, I can give you that number. Do you have that you, Yes, I mean, the, the existing garage on that corner is 13 feet high. And what would the and portion? The, the side wall of the new um, barn-like structure for the loft is 13 feet high. That is the same. It becomes the angle of the roof that makes a change. Um, a 10-foot ceiling in the garage itself and a 3-foot knee wall in the loft above and then to a pitch. I now use that 13 feet right up to the rafters by storing things up there. Uh, and, and that was the, just the intention was to have that be a 3-foot knee wall. So in fact, that corner you're pinpointing the, the, the actual vertical structure, which is moving back to mm -hmm. five feet, stays exactly at the same height, and then the roof line falls away. Thank you. I'd like to go back to Jack's very first comment, and that is on the significant economic injury definition of practical difficulty. Um, again, I realize that this is still somewhat of a new standard that we're working our way through. Um, we had a fairly extensive workshop to talk about the various standards and definitions that we have to walk ourselves through in order to vote up or down um, on a variance request under the practical difficulty. But under the old ordinance that required the undue hardship standard, which required that we find that the property owner had the practical loss of all beneficial use of the land, which of course was almost uh, never the case. The practical difficulty standard relaxes that test by instead of now saying that the property owner was denied the practical loss of all beneficial use, they merely had to suffer some significant economic injury. And that was the relaxing standard. But the definition of this, as I read it, requires that the property owner demonstrate that he or she is being denied the opportunity to have something comparable in size, location, and number to the surrounding neighbors, the 10 surrounding neighbors. So I read this definition as requiring us to look at whether this proposed three car, three stall addition um, is comparable um, in size to what the 10 nearest neighbors have. And <coughs> I th Jack has raised the question as to whether or not, in fact, the 10, close the ten neighbors have comparable structure and it doesn't appear to me that they do. One Chair, thing though. Could I make a comment? Um, Certainly. If there's already an existing garage that, that, that's big as what's proposed or even bigger, would, would that not be a, an issue that would have to be met considering it's already existing in itself? 
I have a thing on that. I don't know whether it does or not, and I think that's something that we ought to at least discuss as a board as to whether that makes a difference. I think um, the fact that he has a three-car garage now is, is something that's compelling. It may not fit neatly in this definition, but I think it, it can be. We can't say that it, this house is, is comparable to the 10 nearest houses already. It's already set apart in that it has a three-car garage be it, it's not constructed similarly. Bruce, is it correct that if the Coopers chose to stay within the footprint of the existing structure, that they would not need a variance? Providing they, providing they did not increase the usable square footage, meaning they didn't add a second floor. Um, and, and, and that's the reason why there's a 10 foot that, that corner had to be taken into consideration because although this may be arguable, the, the, the knee wall is at the out, very outside side of that garage, if you'll notice. So, which means that the usable square footage for that second floor is usable all the way out to the edge where. So the the usable square floor. footage defining the footprint. <coughs> find the usable square footage. In other words, if somebody, usual could, somebody could have had a footprint at 10 feet from the property line, one story. They could get a permit to replace that 10 feet from the property, one story. But if they needed, they wanted to go up to uh, and add a second story, then there would be an increase in the nonconformity because the usable square footage would, would, would increase, which would increase the nonconformity, which hence would require Board of Appeals approval. Well, if they stayed within the same footprint, and went a story and a half. If that like if is being increased proposed usable here. square footage because of the story and a half, then a permit could not issue from my office. Is it the then, a, then a variance would be required. Correct. Is it the square footage of the entire second floor or the portion that's overhang? What I'm trying to get at, just hypothetical, say he was to block off the portion. Well, yeah, if, if mm -hmm. there was a story and a half, as his example, meaning there was a knee wall kicked in at four feet and that, that space was not usable, then that second story would start four feet in from the first floor. And, and that would be Providing that's in, with that meets a the setback, then you could do that. Okay, let me just make sure I say this right because I think I'm confused. If he was to build the same exact structure as it appears in the diagram, except <clears throat> the interior of the second, the floor and the half, which is the non-conforming portion that's over the setback, um, was not usable because it, the wall was built in, that would be okay? Well, it would be, the, the variance wouldn't be needed at 10 feet at that four point. It would be needed at 14 feet because of the additional square footage of footprint that's added on to the, and the colored photograph, colored okay. slide. Can I make a construction comment? Yeah. Um, may, well, I, 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 I clarify your question. <coughs> if you look on would, page seven. Would, would you see? like? Yeah, Mr. Cooper's input? Yeah, because I'm I mean, confused. I mean, in theory, and Bruce, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, I could mm -hmm. build in the exact same footprint, five feet from my present lot line, a 13-foot high garage with a flat roof on it, because it would you be no put higher. A, 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 you could put a slanted roof on it, but if I if couldn't that, store up there, right, and would not need to put be a usable there. space. Right. I mean, that's the key. Right. I couldn't increase the usable space. So I mean, I can I can build again in that irregular shape. What I'm just trying to get at is if you change the shape so that you are happy with the way it's proposed, but for some reason you blocked off the portion of the garage that was non-conforming and it was just not usable space. Is that then? Well, that's easy to do in a, in a finished situation, but an unfinished situation, I think it would be somewhat tough to block it off for a sec and not I mean, use it. It's an unfinished garage as it is. I mean, okay, I was just trying to get us, I was trying to. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't need a variance, though, to do what, you know, to mm. build within five feet, even. In the same footprint. If I'd stayed in the same you footprint. Would still need a well, Mr. Cooper, this is the portion of the hearing that we may discuss these issues with the CEO. Um, and, we, and we do appreciate your input on the construction part. I just wanted to answer Sorry. that. <laughs> I got to clarify that flat roof attack. <clears throat> you know, that ha comment having been made, I agree, Joe, with you completely about the benefit 
to the town of Cape Elizabeth have seen the Gateway Avenue um, improve. And I think any property owner should be commended for wanting to improve their property. We as the board, however, are faced with these ordinances with standards, some of which we may find hard to reconcile with what we want to see done visually. And I just want to make sure that we're being consistent with what we do with one property owner um, and the next one who comes before us the next month and that we're not perceived as being arbitrary based on whether or not a property owner, a neighboring property owner comes in and objects and says, take a look at, um, take a look at the definition of significant economic injury and it's not being met. And we have an obligation to raise that among ourselves. If it's being met, fine. If it's not being met, well, I think we need to address it. I think the unique thing in this particular case is he's not going closer to the property line, but going the opposite direction, away from the property line, trying to make the adjustment. Um, the three-car garage um, is less conforming than what it was or what it is now. There's a proposed one is less, less. Um, it's more conforming. It's no, more conforming. Less, less non-conforming. Less non-conforming. <laughs> My concern was going back, going deeper. I think it shows 40 feet, going closer to the septic system. Uh, I've got no problem in 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 shrinking it, in 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 going farther away from the side property line. I've got absolutely no problem with that. It's just going deeper, the 40 feet closer to the septic system. Bruce is going to assure us that he's going to monitor this and make sure that that's not a problem. So I, I know what you're saying, David, that we have to be consistent, but this is unique, and he's, he's basically increasing that, that, that side setback. And in doing so, maybe he should be rewarded for that effort. He's, in effect, he's doubling the existing side setback from five feet to 10 feet um, and decreasing the square footage of the overall nonconformity by 25%. Um, I understand that and I, and I understand the, the, um, what, what appears to be an inconsistency with that um, action which brings him more in conformity with the intent of the ordinance. And so for that reason, it would seem to be inconsistent to deny it based on the significant economic injury issue. I simply want to raise it for something that we need to consider and discuss. I think that dovetailed with the fact that he has an existing three-car garage. He's pretty much, he's staying with the, the footprint to an extent, um, as Joe just described, and he's increasing the, the conformity. But I think the fact that he has a three-car garage and he can't use it because it's too small I don't think we should penalize him in the fact that he's shrinking the nonconformity and going up, and so he's increasing the square footage, but it's simply because the garage he has isn't usable. He has a garage, it's not usable. He should be entitled to replace the garage to make it usable. <clears throat> I agree with your statement, uh, and I'd like to request the applicant to, ex <clears throat> if I may, to explain the need for the depth of 40 feet, because indeed that's, that is your, that's where you are asking for a variance is to extend the sideline further toward the rear. Uh, most garage depth typically are 24 feet, a larger garage is 28 feet deep, and you're requesting a garage 40 feet deep. That's the only area of contention what, why are you needing to go back 40 feet and not 24 or 28, which would almost put you in a non-conforming, non-changing non-conformance situation from where the existing footprint is uh, into the setback area? Right, and, and uh, most three-car garages I build are 38 to 40 feet wide, and this one is only 34 feet wide to increase that nonconformity and pull back from that five foot setback to that 10 foot setback. So one reason is because of the 34 foot width, I'm picking up that additional square footage instead of in width and depth. 
The other thing is that I clearly use 100% of my existing building and garage to its maximum capability, and with this loft, I'm looking forward to even using more. And so what I have done here is, is maintain the 2,000 square feet of footprint that I have now, even with this nonconformity. To have gone back less would have actually allowed me to have, I would finish up with less storage space on that first footprint than what I have than what I have now, and I'm obviously trying to improve that. I have 43,000 square feet of property here all towards the back, and I did want it to be in appearance as much like a barn-like structure too, rather than just a <coughs> non-conventional. So all those three factors, uh, if I were to make it less in depth, I would have come to you for it being closer to the lot line. You know, not, not moving it closer than the five feet, but I considered the possibility under your ordinance of allowing me to, to build it at that five foot corner <laughs> the back, but this, this shape, and size got me the exact same square footage and footprint that I have now. And as I say, by putting the cars in there, being able to put the things that are in that location now up in the loft above, uh, if I were to shorten it. And in fact, you know, if, uh, if you give me this variance tonight that allows me the 10 feet, that sets that front corner. And I clearly can no go no further than that. If this 40 foot conflicts with my, my, um, my septic system, then I'm going to have to make it 38 or whatever. And that, but in going back there, as I told Joe, we'll have to meet that with a building code requirement. But if I get this variance this evening and I can meet that requirement, I would like this 34 by 40 for all of those reasons I just stated. It primarily maintains the same footprint that is on the property today. Thank you. Inside, it's not in shape. Are we ready to go through the elements? Any other discussion before we go through the elements of the ordinance? Okay, well, let's go through them. And we'll have a vote, uh, <coughs> or at least not a, I, well, whether we call it a vote, whether we call it a showing, but we'll have a determination of on each element as to whether the members of the board feel that the um, elements of the ordinance have been made, have been met. Um, on the very first element, um, by a show of hands, can I see the number of board members who believe that the applicant has satisfied uh, the first element, um, that there is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance? And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of uh, five in favor, zero opposed. Uh, by a show of hands, the number of board members who believe that um, a literal enforcement of the ordinance, a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause a practical difficulty as defined by 30-A, uh, Main Revised Statutes Annotated Section 4353-4C. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of <coughs> five in favor, zero votes. <coughs> um, a show of hands of the board members who believe that the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. That is found in the affirmative by a vote of Five in favor, zero opposed. Um, <coughs> show of hands, the members who um, believe that the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the user market value of abutting properties. That is found in the affirmative by a vote of five in favor, zero opposed. Um, show of hands, board members who uh, believe that the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of five in favor, zero opposed. Um, by a show of hands, the number of board members who believe that there is no other feasible alternative to a, that no other feasible alternative to a variance is available to the petitioner. Four in favor. Um, and I'm opposed. 
um, by a show of hands, uh, board members who believe that the granting of the variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. As found in the affirmative by a vote of five in favor, zero opposed. And by a show of hands, board members who believe that the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas as described in Title 38, Section 435. I think that is a given, um, and that is found in the affirmative by a vote of five in favor, zero opposed. Um, now, would any board member please make a motion to approve the application based on the fact that the board has determined by a, an affirmative vote of at least four board members um, that each of the elements required for approval of the application has been found to exist or to be true. I'll make the motion. I make the motion to approve the application of Craig and Jennifer Cooper for the variance of the strict application of the zoning ordinance. Um, Based on the fact that this board has determined um, by a permanent vote of all eight findings of fact um, by, at by at least four board members that each of the elements for the required for the approval of the application has been found to exist to be true. Do I have a second? <clears throat> second. Mr. Fristasi. Um, all those in favor of the motion or discussion on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? Opposed. Uh, the motion uh, carries by a vote of five in favor, zero opposed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Frustasi. Um, and the application, uh, Mr. Cooper, is approved. And that concludes items of new business. Um, next item on the agenda is communications. Um, I am not aware of any. Bruce, do we have any communications to the board? Have a good evening. Yeah, no, we don't. Yeah. Which brings us to a motion to adjourn. May I make a closing comment myself? Thank you for the, uh, for the application. I just wanted to, as I think that everybody here on this board knows, I wanted to let it be known that I wanted to thank Bruce Smith and, and state that he was extremely helpful in me putting together this 29-page packet in my attempt to get you as much possible information and uh, from what I heard earlier in the evening the difficulty of getting that and what you have to go through to try and do that I think we have a great group of people who work in the office here at Bruce's place that make this possible for people who come in and ask questions and they don't get the recognition sometimes that they should. they're still going to charge you for the Thank permit you. they'll still charge me for the permit before you go Mr. I, I heard you saying that you know that you that for this applicant that came before me We'll probably go back to him for more information and stuff, uh, that sort of thing. Well, thank you and, for and your he's comments. Very, he's very good about that. He was extremely helpful. Thank I you think. for comments and thank you for the submission that you put together. You've set a new standard for applicants who will come after you. 29 pages. However, there was some, one thing lacking, and that was your, your comparable uh, properties around the, uh, the 10 comparable properties. Ten comparable properties. Before you leave, uh, leave uh, you made a comment, and I, sh I too commend you for the application. Uh, maybe this uh, attained my, op my opinion of the, uh, the other one we received. Um, with your permission, uh, I would like to see Bruce use this as an example for other applications submitted to us um, in the coming meetings because it, it provided us with a lot of information that was needed to, to make a, a, um, an educated judgment on this. Thank you, and I'd be honored Bruce. if you want to use that as an example. I have no well, problem. Like, like I said, you have set a standard for those who will come after you. Well, Bruce well, did tell me he had to pay five bucks to each of you to mail it to you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you very much. Meeting is adjourned.